So without um, waiting any longer, I, we go into our next panel, which is the People's Budget, and I do see our guests uh, here on the call. Uh, I will be co-hosting this uh, wonderful discussion with Dr. Melina Abdullah, with uh, Gus Newport, and uh, with our guest, Sharon Lewis, with uh, Tisa Rodriguez, who also is a delegate from Inland Empire, but she's also the chair of the Democratic Party of IE. It is an honor to share the space with you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today, I am honored to share this moment with our honorable speakers whose shoulders we stand on. Before I do the introduction, I also want to take a moment of silence to recognize the lives of our black and brown sisters and brothers lost by police brutality. So let's take a moment of silence and pray for them. Thank you all. Dr. Melina Abdullah, my sister, my mentor. She is a recognized, she is a recognized expert on race, gender, class, and social movements and the co-founder of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. She's also professor and former chair of Pan-African Studies at California State University, Los Angeles. Dr. Abdullah earned her PhD from the University of Southern California in political science and her BA from Howard University in African American Studies. Professor Abdullah is a womanist scholar activist understanding the role that she plays in the academy as intrinsically linked to broader struggles for the liberation of oppressed people. Professor Abdullah is a leader in the fight for ethics studies in the K-12 and university systems and was a part of the historic victory that made ethnic studies a requirement in Los Angeles Unified School District, also serving on the task force for the advancement of ethnic studies for the California State University system. Dr. Abdullah is a mother, a friend, a leader, and she's the author of numerous articles and book chapters and subjects ranging from coalition building to womanist mothering. We also have with us Sharon Lewis, who is the Vice President and Economic Development Chair of the NAACP Riverside. She is a retired teacher, co-founder of Empower You Entertainment, focused on increasing community education on important issues through the arts. We also do have uh, former Mayor Gus Newport with us here on this call. Gus Newport is a social justice activist and independent consultant providing TA in areas of community and economic development, public policy, community organizing strategies, and organizational and systems development. Gus was a program director of the Vanguard Foundation, consultant and senior fellow to the Ford Annie E. Casey Louisiana Disaster Recovery Foundation, Jacobs Family Foundation, and the Mabel Lewis Riley Foundation. Gus also served as the former mayor of uh, Berkeley, and it is our honor to have you here with us. I will hand this over to Tisa to set up some of the house rules here uh, for our guests and for audience members. Please take it away, Tisa. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. Um, it, this is one of those things that we take on um, with full passion, just making sure that we are able to um, to take on and do a lot of a lot of great work that is important to all of us. That we are able to um, to do talk about issues that we really are important to us. And one of the things that we're going to ask is, first of all, we're going to ask each and every one of you to um, to please bring your full consideration, bring incredible questions to please make sure that you are listening openly and asking your questions. You can, uh, if you would like to ask a question, you can um, raise your hand on the blue hand to ask uh, questions. We're gonna ask everyone to keep it positive. 
Um, while we do appreciate that there are multiple candidates in this race, we unfortunately will not be talking about um, Donald Trump in a progress in a favorable light because this is simply not our crowd. We're all Democrats and uh, progressives and we are dedicated to coming up with community centered um, ideas as we see. So raise your hand. Anyone who uh, writes something hateful will be removed immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Tisa. So let's talk about the people's budget. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, um, it is first and foremost an honor to have you here and share this space with you. Take us through the process of how this project came about and what it took in that five years to finally have it proposed at the city council and remove the $150 million from the police budget to allocate toward the social programmings in our communities. Let's talk about that, please. Sure. So thank you, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wonderful to be with you. You look great. It's Sunday <laughs> for me, so I, I didn't do as much as you did. <laughs> you never have to. You never have to. You're gorgeous as is, so. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I can e either give you the long or short version. How many minutes do I have? G give us, give it, give it all. Okay. Give us all of it. You know, that's dangerous when you tell us. <laughs> So I'm still going to try and um, keep it tight, but ask me any questions if you'd like. Um, so Black Lives Matter was born um, seven years ago in Los Angeles. And um, about a year into, maybe two years into our work, we began to look at the city budget. In fact, what was happening is we were having a big protest and there was, um, we were outside of City Hall and someone was coming out of some workshop in City Hall and handed us the budget. And in the budget, budget summary, there's a pie chart. And I had looked at budgets before, but never really paid much attention. But there's this pie chart and more than 50% of our city's general fund was going to LAPD. And it just was outrageous to me. And then I pass it around to the other protesters and we look at it. We're like, that's crazy. Half of the city budget goes straight to LAPD. So we begin to kind of um, get the word out and share this number with folks and people are outraged. And it's not even just the people in the streets who are outraged, that number, nobody really was aware who wasn't a part of this, you know, the city system was, they weren't aware of how much we were spending on LAPD. So as we kind of looked at what was happening in our city, LAPD is the most murderous law enforcement unit in the country. More people are killed at its hands than any other law enforcement unit, right? Um, we realized that the more you spend on LAPD, the more you spend on police, um, the deadlier they become. And so the following year, we begin to push this, um, so it's not a secret now that Black Lives Matter really um, is an abolitionist organization. We don't believe that safety comes either at the hands of policing as we know it or through systems of jails and prisons, right? But most people, when you say, um, I'm an abolitionist, they get really nervous and that doesn't translate well, right? So we, when, what we found is when we talked in budget terms, people tended to latch on right? People tended to say, well, where they wanted their dollars to go was to parks programs or to after school programs or to housing or to meeting the universal needs of people. And so about five years ago, we began saying defund the police, cut back their money. People are now asking, what does defund the, po the police mean? It means exactly what it sounds like, cut their funding so we can invest those dollars somewhere else. So for about four years, we had been pushing around defund the police. Um, also, just so everybody's aware, Black Lives Matter is also um, not a traditional nonprofit organization. None of us get a paycheck for doing this work. All of us have other jobs and responsibilities. So I'm just an educator and mother, but I do the Black Lives Matter work on the side, even though it winds up taking over my whole life, right? Mm. Um, 
So that means that when we're talking about things as big as Los Angeles city budget, we really didn't have the time or energy or resources to invest in mounting a complete campaign. Um, there was one year, um, I believe it was 2018, made it might have been 2017, where we had done some comparative analysis where we found there were studies that had come out about how much more effective intervention and prevention workers were at um, stopping crime, at intervening in crime than police. And so what we found is that you could get double interventionist salaries, give them full benefits, and still hire three of them for every police officer you hired. So we mounted something called a three to one campaign um, for one year. But we didn't really have the resources to launch a complete people's budget campaign until this year. Hmm. And so what happened this year is in the midst of this global health pandemic, right, with an economic fallout at a scale that we've never seen. Um, we wanted to be sure that the mayor was investing in the things that we actually needed, right? So we gathered together um, more than 50 Black-led organizations in LA County. It was virtually every single Black-led organization. We had this marathon meeting and we said, what is it that we want? And so we put forward something called the Black LA Demands. We send it to the mayor ahead of his release of the budget. And maybe three weeks later, he releases a budget that does the exact opposite of what we said. So in the midst of this health pandemic with an economic fallout, he proposes increasing the budget for LAPD, moving it from 53%, it had been climbing, from 53% of the city's general fund to almost 54% of the city's general fund. And so we got really angry, took to social media, and you know, come up with this meme that says, fund services, not police, and then have this really long explanation of why, and it went viral. And so we um, collected, assembled a bunch of partners who were as upset with this as we were. So right, global health pandemic, economic fallout, crime rates plummeting, right? Why would you spend more on LAPD? And so um, we were fortunate to have one partner come on and say, well, what is it that you need to make this happen? And so we said we needed a website. They gave us somebody with expertise to do that. And we built this website, peoplesbudgetla.com. Um, we were really fortunate to have people like Dr. Julianne Malvo and others kind of look at what it was we were doing um, because beyond the budget is also the entire budget process. So this mayor budgets without the input of anyone other than department heads, including the chief of police. But we think this is our money. The community should be engaged around what it is we're spending our money on. And so, you know, as a political scientist, I'm trained in participatory budgeting. We had several online participatory budgeting sessions. We had town halls. Dr. Malvo participated in our first town hall. We had um, people's public comment sessions. Um, all of this to kind of gauge the, um, where our folks were. And then finally, we released a survey. And the survey asked, where do you want to spend your money? We had almost 25,000 people participate in our survey. Just to put it, give you an idea of the scope of that, the CNN presidential exit poll surveyed 24,000 people. And that's nationally. We surveyed almost 25,000 people just in the city of Los Angeles. And they had to demonstrate that they were Los Angeles city residents to participate. And what they said is what they want to spend on is first, the universal needs of people, things like housing and healthcare and mental health, right? The second priority that they had was the built environment, right? Things like libraries and parks. And then thirdly, they were interested in spending on um, transformative and restorative approaches to justice, things like healing circles, interventionists and preventionists. Their lowest priority was spending on traditional approaches to law enforcement. 
So they said that they wanted to spend just 1.6% of the city's resources on policing, traffic enforcement, and prosecution combined. And so that's really kind of what we're coming to with the people's budget. We were successful in getting $150 million cut from the LAPD budget, which basically just puts us back where we were last year. But I think more significantly, um, we're realizing that defunding the police also means moving police out of the business of doing things that they have no business doing in the first place. We don't need police doing traffic stops, right? We don't need police responding to mental health calls. We don't need police um, dealing with our children in parks. We don't need police doing truancy stops, right? What we need is people who are actually trained in those areas. And so one of the most exciting things that we're looking at is this motion that City Council President Emeritus Herb Wesson introduced, which says for non-violent emergency calls, unarmed non-police will be the responders. Um, and then there's a second motion that's on its heels that says also for traffic stops, we're gonna start referring that to the Department of Transportation rather than police. And so we think that this is a way that we begin, there's no dollar figure attached right now, but we know that this is dollars that will be invested in the things that um, people actually need rather than police who you know, serve as a threat to my children and yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. In uh, conversing with Chisa uh, Rodriguez this morning, she brought up such a, an, an incredible, she mentioned a statement that touched me deeply. And, and Chisa, I'm going to ask you to share that in terms of the uh, Poor People's Campaign moral budget. So if you could share that with our audience, what you and I spoke about, I think it's very important and fitting in, in what we're discussing right now. Sure, absolutely. So um, what we, we talked about was just the idea, and the earliest that I heard about the general idea was um, from Delaney Easton, the former Secretary of Education for um, the, the head of the Department of Education for the state of California. Um, but it's the idea that a budget is a statement of your values. Where you are prioritizing and putting your money is a statement of your values. Um, one of the things that the Poor People's Campaign um, has done, and I'll drop a link into the chat in just a minute, and anyone who's interested in looking can, can take a look, but they've developed um, what they're calling a moral budget. And the idea is, is, a, is the same as, as all of us have, it's just taking a look at who in our communities needs to be prioritized, what are we spending money on that does not make any sense. Like, uh, for example, one section talks about the militarization of our police department and continually buying more and more of these things and spending larger and larger portions of our budgets on policing and you know these extra tools for the police but do your tools really need military equipment to do routine traffic stops to handle some of the problems that they're having or can we really take that money and do things like put it into schools for education hire more social workers who specialize in certain kinds of issues instead of arresting people when they have a mental you know, issue and it's, it happens to be public or somebody is at their wit's end and they, they have to, to call and try to bring someone in. Can't we just hire, train and equip a social worker to handle it, someone who is equipped to handle what that family needs as opposed to having someone come in with all kinds of heavy equipment and you know no real training as to how to deal with de-escalating the issue that we need them to have mm -hmm. um, and so the Polish people's campaign just has a lot of these sections it's a massive document so I could never go into really the whole thing but I will put it here for each and every one of you to take a look at when you have some time um, there's a, a great big priority right up front that is near and dear to my heart because it talks about early learning, childcare, education, all of the things that help people to become who they are going to become in life and to be equipped to have proper education and move forward. Because if your foundations aren't good, then the rest of your, your community is really not gonna function well and, um, and everything else you do is a patch. So if our, our morals and our hearts are with our children, then that's who we should be focusing on. 
So absolutely. And 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 so I guess that brings me to my next question, uh, Dr. Abdullah. How do you avoid this process from becoming a top-down process and more of a grassroots uh, organizing effort with uh, the the, uh, the foundations and the NGOs that you've worked with so far? How do we avoid from that uh, uh, having having a hierarchy in the process? Right, well, everything is grounded in community. So we begin with a participatory budgeting process, right? Making sure people are aware that budgets, as Tisa was saying, budgets are moral documents. Dr. Julia Melvo says the same thing, right? These are moral documents. These are um, statements of our ethics, right? Um, and our values and our beliefs, right? Um, and so we begin by talking about where do budgets come from? that these are statements of priorities. And it's really important to remember that this is our money. This is our money. So it really should begin with the people. So everything that, there's a reason it's called people's budget, right? So we begin with this participatory budgeting session where people are made aware of how budget cycles work, how budgets work, um, what we can spend on, what we might, have be, might be spending on that we don't have to spend on, right? And then we engage all along the way. And so even as we move every Thursday night now, so that, that, um, that motion that I mentioned that Councilman Wesson introduced, we're now looking at implementation. So, it's important that you start with the people, but that the people also are engaged all the way through. Because what could happen with that motion is it could be meaningless, right? So we have to do work to constantly bring people into this process. What defines an emergency call? What defines violence, right? What defines uh, police, right? Um, what non-police are we gonna dispatch? Who has the trust of the community? Are there places of abolition, right? So these are all questions we're engaging in now, even though the motion's already passed, we're looking at how do we implement this motion, right? Um, and so it's important that we intentionally engage community through every step of the process and begin from the first step saying, these are what we anticipate the steps to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also, you know, recognizing that um, all community isn't the same. So for instance, last week we did two town halls um, with city council members, one with Mike Bonin, who's on the west side, and then one with about five different council members um, throughout the city. The one with Mike Bonin um, really exploded into a really terrible conversation because what happened is more privileged white folks, more privileged white affluent folks from the West side start asking questions that are really racist. And, you know, we're at a point where I'm, you know, Hania, I know you know me, but everybody doesn't know me. I don't know how to always be polite. So when you're asking a question, what do you say to people who don't believe black lives matter? Hmm. You know, that's a racist question. And I'm gonna have to say, that's a racist question. I'm gonna say you're racist. If you don't believe black lives matter, you're a racist, point blank period, right? And it became this conversation, but so Mike and I, Mike Bonin and I, and I council member Bonin and I had a conversation the next day. And one of the things that came out of that conversation as well as the later town hall, the citywide town hall, is that we really also have to prioritize the communities who are most impacted by police violence. And so it doesn't really matter as much to me what white affluent folks on the West side think should be happening in South LA as what folks who live in South Central think should be happening. And so all voices are not the same. Right, it's important to lift up the voices who are most directly impacted. So, sorry for the long response to the question. Thank you, and 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 that leads me to what I wanted to ask a mayor, a former mayor Gus Newport here. What is the importance of allocating this budget that comes from the people's budget to our most impacted communities? Can you touch upon your experiences as a mayor on what that would look like? 
um, it, with the $150 million that was uh, uh, taken from this uh, 54 point some percent and putting that back in our most uh, vulnerable communities. Tell us some of your experience and how would you allocate that, the funds? Yes, well, I was uh, first elected to office in 1979 when Project when, uh, 13, the, the, the tax rollback was passed. And so I get an office. I had worked for the, uh, the, the city of Berkeley as a senior analyst, recreation and parks and responsible for public relations. So I had some knowledge of inside how government worked. But I get an office and I see that the, the police budget, as in most places, was 60% of the budget. And it just didn't make sense. When you saw the kinds of police brutality that was going on, the use of helicopters, uh, gas, et cetera, and other kinds of things. And I had been on a police review commission when we'd cut out the use of using police dogs of uh, helicopters and any kind of tear gas, et cetera, whatever else. And so I come into office and I was with a group called Berkeley Citizens Action and we had engaged community all over the place. And we engage the people because you can't really define what community needs best unless you do engage the community. Bottom line comes from what is victimizing the community. We also looked at POST, it was the Police Officers Standard Training Association that even worked with the FBI. And we looked at things like Berkeley had seven, uh, one administrator for every seven patrolmen. That was, that was, did not check out any place else in the country. We had police on desk jobs. Police get paid more money because they get hired insurance because supposedly the danger of the job. So we took all police off desk jobs and put uh, people, uh, regular people on those desk jobs. We also redistributed. We did an analysis of when is crime the highest and that's between usually midnight, six in the morning, six to four and things like that. And we redistribute how many to be, but we also recognize because at the same time, Ronald Reagan was closing the mental health institutions. And all those people started coming to Berkeley and San Francisco, thinking that we would be more apt to deal with them. And so we started hiring mental health workers to ride the streets with police and to walk the streets to be able to engage people. And we began to find out with a deeper, deeper analysis, if you're going to lower crime, we need more jobs, better education. So we started taking some of the money from the police department and giving it to nonprofits that were working with job development, et cetera, and increasing, you know, our public education system because you have to look at the totality of need. You know, police is just a continuum of 1690, perpetuating slavery, et cetera, whatever else. I grew up in Rochester, New York, a city that had two race riots in the 60s. I was on the police first police review commission in the country. We had a massive police violence crime in Rochester, went all the way to the, to the federal courts. It was the first one, one in, in the country. The second one was when the police invaded the Black Muslim Mosque. And Malcolm X called Daisy Bates, who was in Rochester organizing. Said, Daisy, I'm coming to Rochester. Who should I be involved with? She gave him my name without telling me. Well, you can imagine when Malcolm called me, I was just taken back. So he called me the first time we talked for two hours and we talked every night for two hours for two weeks. He comes to Rochester on a cold winter's day in Rochester, New York. It's cold in the winter. It's on Lake Ontario, right across from Canada. In those days, the planes landed on a tarmac and I was inside waiting, surrounded by all these white men and fur hat, uh, top hats and white shirts and ties. And Malcolm got off the plane and got took outside and he walked in. He walked in and he said, who was going to snooper? Because we hadn't seen each other. That's the lamp. He said, young blood, you got the best tap telephone in America. This is all the FBI here. Mm. But we went down and got the brothers who had been arrested. Malcolm gave several speeches. I had to leave Rochester. I ended up going to New York where I helped Malcolm ask me to help him develop the organization for Afro-American unity. And I was traveling with Malcolm four days before he was assassinated. We came back to Rochester to give a speech. But that analysis and that depth of analysis, whatever else, as well as having worked in government, I worked for the Department of Labor in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, 
doing economic development, et cetera, whatever else. But the best development, I heard somebody mention uh, uh, Julianne Malvell. Julianne was in graduate school at, in Rochester, so we used to be involved with her a lot of time. Berkeley was a lucky place to be because I would work with the uh, Institute for Study of Social Change run by Troy Duster, who's the grandson of Ida B. Wells. And you must engage the people. Martin Luther King said the beloved community, that was all about engaging the people, whatever else. I mean, but we also got into international laws. I mean, uh, the, the opposition used to say, what the hell's wrong with him? I was, I was vice president for the US at the time to the World Peace Council. I was on to the United Nations Committee, the Committee Against Apartheid, and the Committee on the Question of Apartheid. Mm. Uh, I met Yasser Arafat in Geneva, Switzerland three times, and he had me meet with mayors from some of the uh, Palestinian states and whatever else. There is no reason, as was said earlier, that our military budget has to be what it is now. That is money that should be going towards developing our cities and strengthening our, our, our education system. You know, we're 43rd in the world in literacy and education, 72nd in healthcare. Mm -hmm. But so few Americans have an analysis of this because, you know, history is not truly recorded in this country. It's propaganda. Mm -hmm. And so we have to integrate and get the analysis in depth or whatever. And let me tell you, when I reorganized the Berkeley Police Department, we didn't have any police killings or shootings for 10 years after that. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Mayor Newport, for sharing your stories with us. Uh, indeed, as Marcy said, we are among mentors. I do want to uh, take the question of education to Sharon here, who is an expert and an academic here. Tell us a little bit about Sharon, please, if you would, on the important of the importance of uh, investing in, in our marginalized communities from the police funds in terms of education, and that what would that do, and what would that would look like for our community, black and brown communities in this country? First of all, I would like to say that education is not getting their share of money that's needed, particularly in the black and brown communities. And one of the things I would like to um, address is the intervention programs that often, uh, and, and there are great need for them now since school is being done online. The nonprofits that provide intervention program after school programs, um, usually those programs are in partnership with the school district. But if the school district, if the school district is struggling, then they don't have those funds to make those partnerships. So someone mentioned earlier about um, healing and the drum circles. Those kind of things uh, work beautifully in um, after school program. I run an after school program, Empower You Edutainment. And we do the drum circles, we do the acting, we do the dancing, and we call it um, performing for life so that we can heal. Our young people are suffering with, for trauma. And in the schools, you have resource officers that do not understand our, our, young, um, our young scholars. And so they're constantly um, arresting them. Yes, they are doing that. Even the special needs students, in many cases, our resource officers are, are being used as um, dis, dis, to discipline our, our students that used to start with, with the teachers. The teachers had to come up with their um, discipline plan and work with the parents. Often that is being eliminated and um, some um, educators will call the resource officer because they're there and um, they want to be called. But what they're doing is locking up our students and not all teachers are doing that. A lot of the teachers are doing great things and they have intervention programs that they want to implement, but often um, they can't do all that they want to do because the money is not there. Um, we need to look at the whole child and in looking at that child, and particularly in the, um, in the black and brown community where the greater needs are, we need to look at how can we help those parents? What, what programs are we doing that would be um, directed to the parents so we could educate them? Because many parents are lost with, particularly now when we're going online, or what to do. 
Many of them do not have the equipment that is needed to successfully help their, um, their scholars, their, 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 their babies, their, their, their students, and um, their children. And what we try to do as um, the NAACP, um, we try to help advocate for the parents because some parents are not comfortable speaking and they don't know about budgets. So what we try to do, we try to reach out to parents, reach out to community, pull coalitions together so that we can work together. And if our um, city council members or um, our county supervisors, if they're not listening, then we need to replace them. So we're constantly working with labor. We work with, um, with the organization, both organization, with um, NACP, um, along with um, my uh, nonprofit, we work with labor because we have a common thread. And, and so we work with other organizations that have that common thread so that money can be um, spent in a way. Because when you look at um, the, the pool of money, you have to look at what are the needs of the community. And one of the greater needs of the community is, yes, education for the school, but the school's got to be, it got to go beyond the classroom and got to go into the community because we have to educate our parents. You know, many of them are hurting. Many of them um, need to know about other resources. Maybe they lost their jobs and they need to know what other um, things are available to them. Uh, our NACP, we have an economic um, development committee that I'm on, and T I'm the chair of that. Tisa Rodriguez is on that committee. And what we're trying to do is help parents who have been uh, displaced. Or we're trying to also look at how can we tie in workshops um, and, and um, things that our community would need to empower them. Because if our community empower, our students will be empowered because it all works together. And we need to do better to get more money. And the only way that's going to be done is through organizing. We cannot expect for parents to know what they don't know. So we have to also to um, get our community to understand when they're talking about um, the city council having a budget meeting, we need to pack the place. We need to ask the questions. And we need to make sure that the money is being directed in the way that it will help our youth but help our community because our our our, our community is in need of change mm, absolutely I'll, I'll give it to sister tisa for the next question if you would please uh... yes absolutely so i have a question about getting some of these funds so i'm going to start with melina because she has uh something that is very interesting to us in the chat about LAUSD, about um, defunding school police. Um, how far is that process along? And do we have some other areas where we're working on? I know um, yeah, that we have a number of communities working on it. Melina, can you clarify, please? Sure, so for LAUSD, our initial attempt, and let me say this was totally student-led. We should be completely inspired by our young people um, in LAUSD, these were children as young as 10 years old who said, if there's one place police don't belong, it's in our schools, right? And so they've been trying to get LAUSD school police, which is the largest school police system in the country, they've been trying to get it defunded. So for the last couple of months, as the budget was coming forward, they were saying no more school police. And they had been saying that in years past as well. Um, but they had momentum now because this is the conversation that has really exploded after the murder of George Floyd. The defund the police call that was initiated five years ago has now become this clarion call of the moment. So they begin to push the move to defund school police and invest in things like um, school social workers, nurses, librarians, counselors, the things that you know that you need on a school campus. Um, they weren't successful in getting their first motion, which would have cut school police by 90%. They weren't successful in getting that passed. What they were successful in getting passed a couple weeks later is a cut of school police by 35% and the removal of school police from campus. So we know, you know, if we look at the work like Dr. Uh, Dr. Monique Morris and many others, 
that um, school police are targeting our children for the school to prison pipeline, especially black children, right? That um, they were doing these things called random searches in LAUSD schools, which were not at all random, right? And they were criminalizing children for having things in their backpacks like highlighters and whiteout and Sharpies and the things that mothers like me call school supplies. Um, so the kids were successful in June of 2019 of ending the random searches. The natural extension was the removal of school police. So they won a 35% cut to school police. They won the removal of police from campuses. Police can only be on the perimeter of the campus, not inside the campus anymore. Um, they're not allowed to have, they, LAUSD police actually had AR-15s. They're not allowed to be armed um, inside the campus. Um, they're not even allowed to be uniformed, right? Mm. And so this is kind of the movement, but what, I'm most excited about is the children don't see it. They see it as a step forward. The day after they won it, the um, LAUSD school police chief resigned in protest. Um, the children celebrated his resignation. And then we were at a demonstration outside the district attorney's office. Every Wednesday, we um, protest the district attorney of Los Angeles, Jackie Lacey, for her role in the murder of 618 people at the hands of police since she's been in office. And so every Wednesday we're there and these young people from the Black Lives Matter Youth Vanguard, Students Deserve, as well as um, uh, Sister Lewis mentioned, our labor partners, our labor partners are our teachers. UTLA is deeply involved in this work. So we were all there demonstrating. And then when it was time for the young people to speak, it was just beautiful. Um, the kids ranged in age from 10 years old to 16 years old. And when the 13 year old got the mic, she looked at her little group of comrades and she says, well, we want to thank each other for our victory, right? <laughs> thank each other, not thank the school board, not thank anybody else, thank each other for our victory. And then she says, but we're not finished. We got 35%, but we want all of it. We're not stopping until we get all of it. And so when you ask how far we are, I guess we got 65% to go because the kids say that we're coming back for all of it. Hmm. Dr. Abdullah, I was watching you present the people's budget with uh, uh, Baba Akili and uh, two other fellow um, activists um, whom I can't recall. I forgot their names and, and maybe you could remind me. Uh, unfortunately, Baba Akili was not able to participate in this panel of discussion because of a family emergency. Uh, our, our prayers are with him and his family. He lost a dear um, a family member, but, um, but he was participatory in uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the Medicare for All panel yesterday, which we're very, very grateful for. Uh, there, was a, there was a comment that was very um, touching to me by one of the presenters, and he said that when we walked into the city council, we were greeted by cops, and they were the ones checking temperature. That, to a black man, um, is uh, it, it, it flares up a PTSD and that fear of the police. And I wanted to ask uh, uh, Gus this question, uh, Mayor Newport, tell us about what that looks like um, for our, our uh, Black brothers when, when they have to encounter and they have those conversations with police officers. And what does that do for their mental state? It totally blows your mind. We can, we have no trust at all. I was first assaulted by a policeman when I was 11 years old. Um, I remember that half the boys that I went to school with, by the time we finished school and we were either off to college, the military, or something else, as many as 50% of them were either in prison or dead. And so this is something we've always lived with. Now, um, the social conditions of the day, which expose all these things and bring them more to light. So, but in my day, we even had no way to do it. So as a black man, even having to go before a policeman under those circumstances, he's going to freeze. 
and react. And he might do the wrong thing, which brings on the kinds of actions that, that, that come from police, et cetera, whatever else. The fact is the culture of policing, as I say, goes back to slavery and whatever else is meant to perpetuate the capitalist conditions as such and everything you know in this country. And so you have to totally be able to reform them and get rid of them where they're not applicable and they're not applicable in schools. In Berkeley, we didn't have police in the schools. We had student governments, et cetera, and other kinds of things in this. Um, looking at you know, the reorganization of our education department, we had a lot of students coming in, go to Cuba and look at Cuba. You remember Cuba at the end of the revolution was, was fine, but Cuba today has 0.1% illiteracy rate. America is 42%. We think we're so damn smart, but we're not. We don't have the analysis of whatever else. And there's so many things we could and should be doing that other countries are doing. People in the international world, like I said, I was on the committee on the question of Palestine. A lot of the Palestinian brothers and sisters, under the conditions they live, were coming, getting graduate degrees, and they had to be prepared to rebuild their governments, et cetera, whatever else. We don't have that depth within our country. Malcolm used to talk about that, et cetera, whatever else. We've got to look through the eyes of both in our own circles as well as internationally, et cetera, whatever else. But all the necessary things that have to be done. I mean, we, we, we passed an initiative uh, to, to provide child care to, to, to poor, because 72% of the heads of households in poor communities are single women. All those kinds of things have to be taken into consideration to look at the data of what's the analysis around which we build, we build our societies, our budgets, et cetera, whatever else. That's in city government, that's in schools, that's in universities, et cetera, whatever else. And it's gotta be done from a community perspective, doing it together. It's about creating that beloved community. Right. Um, Dr. Thank you very much. So uh, I do have another question, but I, I just want to interject something really quick too, that um, a number of years ago, I was on a, a community panel um, within the city that I live in here in Paris. And um, we, we had uh, presentations from different departments. And at the time, the guy who was our brand new shiny chief of police, who was so excited, second day in comes comes in, starts talking to us, and he starts talking about good news, good news. We finally found the money to give you a school resource officer at your high school. And he was so proud of it. And, and I'm sitting there like, okay, school resource officer, like please justify. And then the next thing he says is, but just remember that we're not babysitters. And we made sure we told your mayor that we're not gonna babysit your kids. So don't expect us to babysit your kids. And I'm thinking to myself, well, the point of a school resource officer is supposed to be to help ensure the safety of the kids, not to police them or to babysit them, I would think. And the person sitting next to me on the, in the same committee chimes in with, yeah, because they're a bunch of little hoodlums. Mind you, this is a majority minority city. We have a lot of black students. This was a black woman and she was on the school board and still is and i'm proud to say we found somebody to run against her so run for school board that's the entire point of the story run for school board and um, be thinking about how you would like to spend your dollars in a way that is productive and helpful to the children and um with people that are considering your children as people um but now i, I want to ask a question about um some solutions. So there's one that we are starting early discussions with um, here in Riverside County and uh, Mr. Ron Lewis has been in some of the early discussions but has also been working with some of the different um, officials to bring them to the table. So can you please tell us Mr. Ron about um, the, the early just some of the early discussions you're having with the Board of Supervisors about the advisory board and then the discussions you've been having with the, the Chief of Police and stuff? Um, yes. Um, basically, it's a coalition. Um, it's, uh, the NAACP is involved in that. Even our, and you know what? I am so proud of our youth council because they're there. They're, they're everywhere. And um, 
it's funny because they had a their own um, discussion. They had a um, discussion on police reform, and we were hacked, but we were, were we came back, you know, um, because in their hearts they they want change. They're there in at the schools, and they see the injustices that are going on. So we started with Moreno Valley School District because of the fact that we've gotten so many complaints with um, the parents and um, we wanted to defund um, that particular um, resource offices in school and use the money for uh, mental health um, workers to come in and work um, with our, um, with our um, scholars. And uh, one of the things that we discovered is that you have parents that understand the need for that, for that change. Um, and then you have other parents that um, people are telling them, well, if you don't have the police officer, school would not be safe, which is totally not the case. Uh, we had a situation in Moreno Valley um, School District, whereas um, one of the child was, um, be, was and he was in the middle school um, in a police uh, choke and we did not know that but he was special needs and um, he was referred to um, the disability um, Los Angeles disability group that um, took that case and they were the school district had to release um, release uh, um, the videos and the young boy was um, and he did not share that with the parents because most likely he was traumatized, but he was in, um, held down in police choke because he refused to do something that the teachers wanted him to do. You can look at that as documented, but to get back to what we was talking about, we're working and organizing. We're dealing with um, the county um, um, board of supervisor and we're letting them know certain things about the budget um, that so that they could understand um, the voice of the community. We're organizing, we're having um, various groups um, that are speaking at every um, meeting and bringing up the budget and how they feel the budget, what it should look like. And what we're doing in, um, in Riverside, everyone can do. And I think that LA is, is doing a great job, but all communities, need to um, organize and, and, and go to those meetings and, and bring up these concerns. If you have a concern um, with the sheriff's department, and that is a big concern in our area, then you need to voice that. And we also need to do trainings of to teach um, our community members who are not comfortable talking um, in front of a group uh, help to help them, not to tell them what to say, but to help them through the process. And particularly now, since you got to use, um, you got to call in. If you don't call in by a certain time, then you will not be heard. We have to let them know how to do that and encourage them to do that. The other thing is, is that we have in our coalition, we not only have organizations, but we have the churches involved. And so please do not forget the churches because they are very much um, committed to change. They're the first responders often when there's a problem um, within the community, um, pastors are aware of it. They will call the NAACP. So what we're doing in our um, circle, we call it you know, more or less various organization, more like a village working together for change. And one of the things we want to do is make sure that the money that we have all allocated um, uh, within uh, Riverside County is being used, um, not the majority money for policing, but the money to be used within the community in um, interventions. Uh, thank you, uh, Sister Lewis. And uh, that brings, up to our, our, uh, brings me up to our last question from uh, Dr. Abdullah here. Uh, before we open it up to our uh, audience members and attendees uh, to raise their hands to ask a question. But Dr. Abdullah, there is this eager um, need to find out uh, how does one get started um, with the people's budget in their own community and in their own city? 
So you have to start with your own community. I don't know your community the way I know Los Angeles, but I think that you always start with a collective of people, right? Um, if you can get the information on what your budget looks like and get people, um, we know that people move based on not just what they think, but mostly based on what they feel, right? So if you can show, look, we're spending, and most major cities do spend, upwards of 50% of our city's general fund on police, most people are outraged. Figure out how to harness that rage. How do you then kind of become a hub for folks to begin to organize? Um, this work is really, really hard. I want to be real clear about how constant the work is and how challenging the work is. We do phone calls every single day on the people's budget. So every day at three o'clock, we are on the phone talking about people's budget, talking about what we're doing next. We've also been trying to be pretty intentional in archiving everything that we do so that if folks want to replicate it, they can just go to peoplesbudgetla.com. You can see what it is we're doing. Um, in September, we'll um, probably have a two hour, we're looking at doing a two hour televised town hall on people's budget. Um, so we're trying to, uh, we're in negotiations with a platform right now about being able to broadcast it because we do get questions. Um, I never knew the budget would be such a hot item, right? <laughs> but groups from all around the country are hitting us up, asking us how to do it. Um, the basic things I would say is get your people together, get your information organized, um, figure out how to go out and engage people beyond your organized groups, um, and then be constant and consistent in your engagement. It's time, most places, most cities um, have a budget cycle that goes through June 30th. And so if you're on that same cycle, it's time to start gearing up for next budget cycle. Mm -hmm. We have to be ready to go. We wanna do this far better this year than we did last year. So we can have a completely alter a complete alternative budget that we present. Mm -hmm. And then we gotta figure out how do we create pressure to get it adopted. That was really our goal. It was the first time presenting it in such a way this year. You know, adopt the people's budget was one of our demands, right? Let's have the budget ready early so we can get a lot of momentum so everyone is saying adopt a people's budget. So those are the things that I can recommend now and all of our, we're very grateful to the um, People's Budget Collective and everybody who's been highlighting this. So thank you, Hania, for doing this session um, so that we can begin. This is how we begin to shift things. So thank you for this. It is an honor and a privilege to have you here, um, uh, Melina, uh, as well as uh, Mayor uh, Gus Newport and our sister, Sister Lewis. Uh, I do want to open it up to the audience to ask questions. I know Ron has had his hand up since the very beginning of the conversation, so <laughs> you must be eager to ask your question, Ron. Go right ahead. Um, yeah, so grateful for the organizers for organizing this and our panelists for coming to educate us today. And, you know, I, um, it, the, it, there's, of all recent activism that I've been involved in, this is the single most like lowercase d democratic thing I have been hearing about. Like getting community and people involved in these priorities. I'm so grateful for that. But you could ask, and I asked you in the, in the chat informally, but you could ask the question, why haven't we had a people's budget? Like, shouldn't that be the default? I mean, and, and I, and and to what? And then I'll, this is there a question maybe for Professor Abdullah or for Mayor Newport or or, 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 or Ms. Lewis? It, um, to what extent is the spending of, for example, um, law enforcement unions or correctional workers unions money on political races? A, a, to the detriment of people's budgets, campaign contributions, and independent well, I can, expenditures. I, I can give you an example. When I ran for re-election in 1983, I think it was, 
The white police were holding a press conference in the basement of City Hall, uh, sharing false data. And a couple of black policemen came up to the fifth floor and said to me, said, they're having this press conference downstairs. You better go listen to it. And so I went down and I said to the press, this is all false here. And the white police got mad and, and because the black police were intervening and called me in and said, you know, we will shoot some of you. And the black police said, well, we got guns too. So we were able to dispute that particular information because police organizations long have bought off various parts of the city to make sure that they get in. Interestingly enough, when Berkeley reorganized this police department, we brought in more black police that had to have uh, bachelor's degrees, et cetera, whatever else. Uh, we did such things because homelessness was coming to be a, a problem too. We took yellow school buses and bought them and put them on a marina and put porta potties in them so that the homeless could sleep in them and gave portable showers outside assigned each one of them to a mailbox so they could apply for SSI and things like that. And just got a better analysis. I only found out after I had left the, being mayor of Berkeley that 12 of the black police we hired were formerly back Black Panthers who had an analysis from a community standpoint of what is in the best interest, et cetera, whatever else. So it has to be from a community perspective with a real depth of analysis, et cetera, whatever else. And uh, I must say, I feel fortunate right now, Berkeley is reorganizing this police department things again. They've called me, I'm involved in some Zooms. And uh, I live in Oakland, which is doing a public safety task force and advisory board. And at the age of 85, I just applied to be on that board. Commission. So the, the beat goes on, but I mean, we all must get involved with it because the fact is, we're trying to create a better America for the future of our children and grandchildren. You know, we can't sit still, especially at this moment. I, get, I started to say something, but I remember they said, don't say anything about our president. So I'll leave that out. So, If I could just quickly add on and um, thank you, Mayor Newport. I was actually a beneficiary of your um approach to school police i went to willard junior high and berkeley high school and i often tell the story of mr williams at willard who right. was um our i don't know what he was called but he wasn't a cop and he would meet you at the door and if you were naughty like me he would shake your hand real <laughs> hard in the morning look you in the eye and say now you have a good day <laughs> <laughs> and that's all we needed that's all we needed and sometimes we had fights because we were kids and kids sometimes have fights but we didn't go to jail for having a fight that's what kids do right yeah, yeah. and so we need to make sure that we invest in the things that um, make our children and make our people safe um, when Ron asked the question about why we're not doing this all over the country one, I think that people are rising up all over the country and say, saying that we have a right and governments have an obligation to do this. This is the people's money. This is not their money, right? Um, but I want to also point to cities um, or to the city of Jackson, Mississippi, and what Chokwe Lumumba is doing there who actually starts his budget cycle with participatory budgeting sessions, who actually engages in ongoing people's assemblies and says that, you know, if we are really a democratic society, um, you can't have anything for the people without the people. And I think that we need to make sure that we elect leaders who understand that, who are in the pocket of the people, not the police, because um, you also asked that. Um, police associations that disguise themselves as unions. I don't believe they're unions. I'm a union member. Um, union members and unions are supposed to act on behalf of working class people. Police associations do not. They only act on behalf of police, right? right. And so I think that it's really dirty that police associations have such a heavy hand in um, electoral politics. And we should start demanding that candidates reject all police association dollars. We should demand that they don't take those dollars. If they take those dollars, that tells you who they belong to. Mm. 
Thank you, um, Dr. Abdullah. Um, Sudi has her hand up. Sudi, go ahead, please. Mary messaged me. She's next on staff. Okay. Mary. Yeah. Mary, can you unmute and ask your question, please? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Let me make my volume a little higher. I just wanted to ask the panelists, first of all, thank you so much for coming today. We're really enjoying this discussion. I was wondering if you support, besides defunding police and shifting the budget to social services in cities, what about defunding jails at the county level and defunding prisons at the state level to shift to money to social services and other programs? Thank yeah. you. Yes, if you're in Los Angeles, please watch for Measure J. Um, we just um, were successful in getting this measure. It's called Reimagine LA. Measure J, we were successful in getting it on the ballot for November 2020. What it will do is pull money out of the spaces that are oppressive to our county and invest it in resources. These are additional investments beyond what we already have. We also know that we were successful with Measure R in stopping um, the expansion of the jail system and diverting funds into things that actually make communities safe. So again, um, we know that neither police, prisons, or jails make communities safer. It's really investment on the front end on um, making sure people have the education that they need, have the resources that they need, housing, health care, mental health resources, um, those kinds of things that make safe communities. Mm. Thank definitely. you, Dr. Abdullah. Go ahead, Mary. You no, want? definitely. As, as, as we go through reform, there's no need for the amount of people being in prison and jail that we have. And it would be more functional on the outside. Remember, so many of our prisoners are doing work for corporations, uh, et cetera. And, you know, we need, we don't need, I mean, we have some two, three million people in prisons more than all the rest of the prison populations in the world. There's no means of justification for something like that. It's about time to change as we reform our society. And I just like to add that Riverside um, County is known to get very, stiff um, um, penalties to people with nonviolent um, you know, crimes. Often um, they're spending a lot of years in prison and um, starting with our juvenile system rather than, um, I would like to see, and what we're advocating for is more of those funds being used to um, intervention programs. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll go over to Sudi, um, and I do also see Desiree, Ma Margaret Okazumi and Desiree Rojas both have their hands up, so. Sudi, please unmute. Thank you so much. Um, so I work with an organization called Women Intercultural Network. Uh, they've been working for 25 years trying to make sure that United States, um, who's only the largest uh, country that has not signed CETA, uh, the Coalition Against uh, Discrimination Against Women. And uh, they brought that to um, City for CETAs and Los Angeles, San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland are all signatory and Los Angeles is the biggest one. And they really reallocated uh, the budget to make sure that they're addressing issues that uh, women and children are facing and by providing um, equitable solutions. So my question here is that, you know, somebody in the chat said, why don't we have people's budget be the way uh, of this country? That that's how we determine budget, that we go and take uh, questions of the people and find out what their priorities are, just like the poll that we've been uh, posting along the past two days, trying to understand what are the priorities? What, what do we people think that are the biggest threats uh, to our nation? And so I, and I wanna know if the people's budget uh, that's meeting every day, that's awesome. Uh, I know what that takes, um, has worked with other 
um, you know, movements like Cities for Cedars and all the other ones to really collaborate and lift and make this a statewide, nationwide uh, effort. Uh, that uh, that's how we set our budgets. Thank you so much again for being here. So we haven't yet worked with um, many different organizations. Uh, the organizations, the coalition that we work with is about 30 organizations in Los Angeles County. Um, we are working, so Black Lives Matter is the anchor organization. Um, we are working with other Black Lives Matter chapters around the country to replicate this work nationally through BLM chapters. Um, but that's kind of the platform that I was talking about. Having this two hour town hall is a first step. One of the things we need to lift up is, and I think I've said it already, that this is not our job. So, so it's very difficult for us to um, take on the responsibility of doing it nationally or coordinating across platforms, coordinating across um, organizations um, without having everyone pitch in because, you know, school starts back next week and I have to teach classes and, you know, everybody else has to do their own work. And so we're looking forward to expanding the work, but recognizing that the, the more that we expand means that we need more hands on deck. So we're definitely welcoming everybody into this work so that we can um, get it done and make it, you know, the way that we do budgeting throughout the country. Yeah. One of the things that um, from just coming to this today, I'm going to our economic develop, um, development, development committee we're going to organize a budget meeting just to talk about the budget. I think one of the steps that we all can do is to educate our community. Um, maybe those of you um, that are listening today, maybe you know um, the power of organizing and, um, but do our community members know the importance of us um, complaining or giving suggestions and um, making sure that um, those elected officials are listening to us when we talk about our particular needs in our community in terms of the budget and how the money is spent. So that's something simple um, that each of us can do, go back into our communities and have these conversations uh, within our economic development committee. We have members from all various organizations that are part of the NAACP. So if we start the conversation, what is going to happen? They're gonna to go to their own um, um, group that they're involved in. And then if we all are having this conversation, then we could put down collectively what we feel that budget to look like and go uh, and be prepared for next year to make sure that some of the things that we know should no longer be funded, that they, those things are replaced with things that should be funded. Yeah, uh, 1988 to 1992, I directed a project called the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative in Boston, Massachusetts. The state of Massachusetts has on the book that if a nonprofit can put forth a master plan that's accepted, they will give them the rights of eminent domain to take over X amount of property within a given jurisdiction. We were able to put together that master plan and been the only nonprofit in the history of the United States to accomplish that. And we did it because we created a master plan that included the small businesses, included all the churches, it included all the people, the women, Etc. You name it. And as we began looking for, for 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 financing and funding, we went to the banks. And of course, they didn't want to admit that they've been victims of redlining. But of course, redlining comes from the New Deal. Even though Franklin Delano Roosevelt thought, put forth the work kind of strategies, he had to have the Southern legislatures on board in order to pass that. And so, redlining is in place until this day. 
The problem with America, including academics and such or whatever else, we don't have an analysis of history to the depth of looking at what perpetuates all those things. And you've got to study all those things and bring them to the people and make them understand because if we did them, we sort of went back and told the banks we wanted X number of millions. And they said, well, we're not going to admit this, but they said, I'll discuss it with us for 18 months. Finally, the banks created a community development corporation, which the smallest banks had to give as much as 500,000, the biggest banks, a million for affordable housing and for small businesses within the black and brown communities. They began to understand better even from their own standpoint because they said the kind of work that we were doing was more satisfactory than some of the loans they were given to the big corporations and things and whatever else. We've got to stay at it and we've got to have women especially because women have a vision from a planning standpoint of where the child care center should be, where the grocery market should be. We had a school, for instance, a, a, a grammar school that the kids were always coming home with scratches on their legs. And when we got involved in this process, the mothers went up there and, 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 the, and the schoolyard was all cement. They said, why don't you dumb fool dig up the cement and make those schoolyards sand and something like that. After that, there was no more scratches on the kids' legs. Little simple things that we men don't think of, generally speaking, are people in charge or something, come from the mouths and the minds of women, and we have to make sure that they're encouraged to be involved in all, of, all, the, all the planning and development that we do. Thank you, Mayor Newport. Uh, we do have uh, time for two more questions. Um, I do see Margaret Akazumi's hand. Um, Margaret, if you can unmute yourself. Uh, Lauren, we may have to unmute her. I can't find her on the list. Uh, yes, okay, it was not letting me unmute. Uh, thank you, Hanie. Uh, so over my years as an activist, I I've come to realize that uh, there are some folks who are really good uh, on policy, you know, they're really good policy monks, and others are, um, are good at organizing, and usually the two different types of people, um, our brains work differently, and it's, sometimes it's hard to bridge the two. And so, I, you know, for myself personally, to look at a budget document, um, that's not something that is like easy for me to do without like falling asleep. And I'm wondering how you make the case to people. How did you outreach to 26,000 Los Angeles um, uh, get get so many people to become engaged and make this relevant and something that they want to um, weigh in on? Um, how did you do that outreach? Was it, um, and, and I guess a lot of this happened pre-COVID, so maybe some of it was online, but did you knock on doors? Um, I, I'm just really uh, interested to know like how you made this relevant and accessible and important to people. Sure, so it actually was not pre-COVID. We got all of those responses in the span of about three to four weeks. Um, so the first set of responses came in before George Floyd was murdered. And then the second set of responses came in after he was murdered. The first set of, it's interesting to look at the responses because prior to George Floyd's murder, people wanted to spend 5.4% of the city's general fund on police. After the murder, where about the second half of the responses came from, it dropped from 5.4 to 1.6. So it seems that everybody who completed the survey after George Floyd was murdered said that they didn't want to spend any money on police, right? And that's what you have to get to kind of um, get that overall number. Um, what I think, why I think we were successful is we already have a base and a standing. And so um, doing ongoing work um, helps to legitimize us. Even so the city decided not to use our survey for the implementation of the motion that I mentioned. They decided to release their own survey, which is not as sound as ours is, but we still want people to participate in it because that's the survey that they're gonna be using, right? 
so initially the city i think had 8,000 responses. This is the official city survey that was sent out by city council and the mayor. 8,000 responses. And then Herb Wesson reaches out to us, to Black Lives Matter, and goes, can you amplify the survey? We send it out, and within a matter of a couple of days, we got another, I think, 19,000 responses. So what that's about is just, I think, the work, the ongoing work of organizing earns the trust and engagement of people. And so it's why when we're in the streets and say, everybody come out, um, you know, it translates there too. So when we were in Hollywood, we had um, over 100,000 people um, turn out in with less than a day's notice. It's because they've been engaging with us. We've been kind of building that platform and I think that that's what did it. So um, the lesson for me is the constancy and consistency of the work is really, really important when you want engagement. I totally agree with that. Uh, we are engaging a lot with um, our community. You don't have to be an NAACP meeting to come to our Zoom meeting and we're talking about um, education. Everything has a budget. Let me just say that. Education, you have, you know, a, a line item. You know, um, economic development. Uh, all of these things um, have a line item. And so we just have a meeting, and that meeting um, specifically deals with a topic, and that topic brings on these types of conversations. And then once we have a conversation, then we'll talk about what are we going to do? And, and basically we have been going more so to city council meetings um, and, you know, and to uh, the uh, county um, supervisor um, board meetings more than ever um, since I've been um, actively um, doing this work. And it's been for me 10 years and I'm so happy. And it used to be a thing, oh, the community is not interested. Yes, they are. And, and when you look at organizing, look at your school budget. A lot of times parents don't realize the right that they have to discuss and go to the school board meeting and, and discuss that budget, which is very important. And, and know what the, and, and you know, one of the things that I believe the NAACP we're going to look at in our economic um, development committee how to read a budget. I think that that would be very valuable. When I was doing um, active work in the union, I had to know how to read the budget for me to advocate for uh, my membership. And first I was like, oh, Lord, help me. I, I, I'm, uh, that's not my thing. But when you start working at that, you, get, you begin to understand what that is and then it's people that love to crunch numbers and they will support you so surround yourself around those people and let me just say this to everyone organize 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 this is what this is all about and the time is perfect now and let's go with what john lewis has said let all of us get involved in some good trouble mm. because it's needed let us all be that voice for our community, particularly for those who are voiceless, who have given up on hope. We can do it. We can do it. Yes, I agree generally with all which has been said. We must engage our communities, but we must also engage institutions. I was very lucky to have support from various departments, the University of California, Berkeley, the Institute for the Study of Social Change, Troy Duster, who is the grandson of Ida B. Wells, the planning department, I had breakfast with the chancellor twice a month who would provide other kinds of things. I looked at various other places of Doha. I, I began to understand training and development more back in the days when I was with Malcolm X. If you look at the early days of the uh, black Muslims and then post that when we created the organization of Afro-American unity, Malcolm was a brilliant planner and strategizer. And so I was doing all this thing long before it comes from a variety of places and we now we, once you get your plans done you got to get them financed so you have to know how to get the banks and other people to buy into these things etc or whatever else 
it, 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 it takes a while, but we're at a place in time where we should be ready and able to do that. And let me tell you something, in this post-pandemic time, we're gonna have to rebuild the cities of America because it's got all this market rate housing that's been built downtown, especially places like Los Angeles and San Francisco. And people are not gonna be moving into those. That could become affordable housing and other kinds of complementary things, but you gotta have the analysis and the vision to see that. Thank you so much. So um, we do have to, to wrap up pretty quickly, but we have one person left who's patiently had her hand up, Desiree. Um, why don't you ask your question really quick and then Hanya will do a very quick round up, uh, wrap up and then we'll be able to get on to the next program. Thank you. There we go. Desiree, can you unmute yourself please? Again. Okay, I thought I did. Thank you. Mine is more of a statement. I, 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 I wish I had more time to speak. Um, I've been a long time uh, organizer, uh, labor organizer uh, in California, and my, you know, my parents were on the great boycott in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So uh, the fight for farm workers has always been uh, uh, number one in our family and in my life as an organizer for over 40 years. Um, but what I'd like to talk about uh, and mention is uh, in rebuilding our cities and communities, I think it's very important that organizers or people who want to be organizers start dissecting, uh, like they've mentioned, these budgets, but look at the generational wealth in these counties. I live in Yolo County. We're dissecting our county budget, and what we're finding is that there's a lot of generational wealth tied to all these boards of supervisors, city councils. So getting our people and getting uh, people of color elected, that's one. But paying attention to all of those people seated on those chairs of those local departments, Department of Housing, WIC, uh, et cetera, you're gonna find that there's a lot of names that are very similar because the generational wealth of controlling a lot of these boards has been going on for over 50 years. And the reason why there's so many positions where people are getting paid over $250,000 in some of these counties that are small, like Yolo County, is because they do a per capita measurement against neighboring counties. But the end result is that this is a large part of the systemic racism that we're fighting. The majority of the money is ending up in the counties. It's not at the city council level. Maybe at Los Angeles, of course, it's a larger budget, but we are the fifth largest economy in the world. We're driven by agriculture and we have growers and we have those trinational corporations that have their lock hold on a lot of these seats and, the, and these boards and commissions and committees and especially supervisory boards. Mm -hmm. So the racism, rooted racism there has to be pulled out and once it's pulled out and we can start electing people and really dissecting these budgets and, and review, review the, the classifications and the amount of money that is going to, uh, in, into these jobs uh, for being uh, you know, uh, uh, department chairs, when we start comparing those classifications and those pay, the, the, their, their earnings, in the county, they're making more money overseeing a, um, a personnel of 200 people than a California State Department director. Thank you, Desiree. Okay, so that's something to really pay attention and to look at. Thank you, and I wish we had more time uh, because that's such an important point that you bring up, uh, uh, Desiree. Thank you for sharing that with us. I do want to um, ask Dr. Abdullah if uh, she could please guide us on how we can help out with the Black Lives Matter movement in terms of donating and showing up in numbers. Uh, that would be great, and then I'm going to do a, uh, the last, uh, the goodbye, I guess, for the panel. <laughs> Sure. So we would love to have everybody involved. Um, you know, there was a time uh, just a few weeks ago when we were hundreds of thousands in the streets. Um, that is waning a bit, but we can't afford to let it wane. I know that we're pushing people out to the polls in November, but we have to remember that no people have ever voted themselves into freedom. 
right? We have to engage in both protest and politics. So we need you in the streets. So we need three things for you. We need your voice. We need you to make sure that you are amplifying what it is we're saying in Black Lives Matter. When we say defund the police, don't let them tell you that that doesn't make sense. It makes perfect sense, right? So those of you who are teachers, who are doctors, who are doing other things, who aren't seen as, you know, BLM folks, we need you to keep saying defund the police, right? Number two, we need your bodies. What that, what that means is we need you out in the streets. So every single Wednesday at three o'clock, we're in front of Jackie Lacey's office saying that she has to go, um, but also saying that the police who kill our people have to be held accountable. So every Wednesday at three o'clock at 211 West Temple, and there's lots of other things that you can lend your body or your virtual body to. Um, making sure you call into city council meetings. Um, our Los Angeles Police Commission just cut public comment back to 45 minutes total. Um, and we think that that's hugely undemocratic. Um, and so we need people to make sure their voices are heard um, and lend your virtual body. And then finally, we do need your dollars. And so um, donate what you can to Black Lives Matter. Um, we People have been very generous over the last couple of months, but we know that it takes a lot of money to get to the point of institution building, to get to the point of being able to hire somebody instead of keeping me up till four o'clock in the morning. Maybe I can only stay up till two if we get some people that can help us with this work. Um, and I wanna be clear that there's thousands of us that are members, but working on transforming the world takes hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. So that's what we need. You can follow us at blmla.org. That's our website, um, BLM Los Angeles on Instagram and BLMLA on Twitter and um, sign up for our newsletter on the website. Sister, I can listen to you go on all day long. Oh, Blinking you, and I are getting tired, so I thank you. I wanna thank you everybody for participating here on today's uh, uh, panel. And I wanna um, send, extend my gratitude to our honorable speakers, my sisters uh, and mentors, uh, Dr. Melina Abdullah and Sister Lewis, and uh, Mayor Gus Newport for continuing to uplift the voices of the voiceless uh, in our country. And uh, we, you have our full support. You can also uh, catch my sister, Dr. Abdullah, uh, presenting on systemic oppression, Black Lives Matters with Senator Nina Turner at the American Muslim Democratic Caucus, August 19th from 2 to 3 p.m. That should be a very interesting panel.